Good afternoon from Gadigal country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, airs and waterways here and wherever you are joining from today. And I pay my sincere respects to elders past and present. And I pay my respects too to elders joining us today. I'd also like to extend that respect to the elders past and present of the place that I was born and raised, Ghana and Paramount country in the Adelaide Hills, a place of grey box, wattle and koalas, the place that I'll always call home. Hello, my name is Marnie Round. I'm a Senior Manager in Policy Research and Strategic Programs at Reconciliation Australia. I'm also very happy to be your MC today as we mark the release of this collaborative research recognising community truth-telling and exploration of local truth-telling in Australia. And hello and welcome to the nearly 1,500 of you joining us today. The response to this webinar was instant and overwhelming and something from which we should all take heart. It shows the hunger is strong to engage with real stories from real people away from the overwhelming media environment we're all currently surrounded by. Now more than ever, we seek these stories of truth telling, the truths of people and places, and today you will hear directly from some of the voices featured in this report. Auntie Patsy Cameron, Auntie Enid Tom, Uncle Michael James Witty Welsh, Tiffany McComsey, and Peter Jones will be in discussion with Dr. Vanessa Borowski, the principal researcher on this report. The immense perseverance of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in undertaking truth telling is what has got us to this point. This work has often occurred with limited resources and support, yet community truth telling has been key to shifting the national narrative about Australia's history. This report documents grassroots community truth telling in Australia through 25 community truth telling projects, including 10 in-depth case studies. These case studies provide easily understandable examples of what truth telling looks like, what constitutes best practice, and how to ensure safety and protection from re-traumatising. The report is based on a unique collaborative study by researchers at Deakin University's Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalisation and Reconciliation Australia. Reconciliation Australia is the lead body for reconciliation in this country. As an organisation, we've been working at creating a more just, equitable and reconciled Australia since 2001. Before that, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation paved the way for Australia's formal reconciliation process. We stand on the shoulders of profound leaders whose foundational work still guides and drives us. Reconciliation Australia's CEO is Bunjalung woman, Karen Mundine. She brings to the role more than 25 years experience leading community engagement, public advocacy, communications and social marketing campaigns. She's been instrumental in some of Australia's watershed national events, including the Apology to the Stolen Generations, Centenary of Federation Commemorations, Corroboree 2000, and the 1997 and 2021 Australian Reconciliation Conventions. I'm so pleased to welcome Karen Mundine to open our event today. Thank you, Marnie, and thank you everyone that's joining us today. I'm joining you um, from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, also known as Sydney. And given that we're talking about truth telling today, it would be remiss of me not to mention that the country of the Gadigal people was ground zero for colonisation. It was one of the first places where Aboriginal people and the colonisers came into relationship with one another, which set the scene for much of what was to unfold across the rest of the nation. These lands are characterised by Gadigal history, culture and strength from both before and after colonisation. So consequently, I wish to acknowledge and pay respects to the Gadigal elders, those of today and yesterday, who have kept these stories alive and who provide guidance and wisdom. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which you are all joining. And in particular, I pay heartfelt respects and thanks to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities who contributed their stories to this report. It is a profound honour to have their insights and experience guiding us as we look at community truth-telling. 
I especially want to thank uh, Professor Vicky Greaves Williams, who we'll hear from in a moment, but also particularly to Arnie Patsy Cameron, Arnie Enid Tom, Uncle Michael James Welsh, Dr. Tiffany McComsey, and Peter Jones, who will all contribute to the panel later on in this session. Now, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, short because we don't have very much time, and it's really their stories that are most important. I am very proud to be here launching the Recognising Community Truth-Telling and Exploration of Local Truth-Telling in Australia report. As Marnie said, this research is a culmination of a collaboration between Deakin University's Alfred Deakin Institute and Reconciliation Australia over the last couple of years. And it was only made possible because of the many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were willing to share their stories with the researchers so that we may all learn. Stories about incredible leaders, First Nations and non-Indigenous, who have broken barriers and fought to have truths about our shared history heard in communities right across the country. Now, as we all know, the truth is not always well received in Australia, and it is clear that we as a nation are still reckoning with the way that this country's history has been told through representations of our collective identity and national story. Until we share and accept Australia's true histories from before and after colonisation, we cannot be reconciled. Truth-telling has been central to reconciliation since the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, Reconciliation undertook its work more than 30 years ago. As the 2000 Australian Re Declaration Towards Reconciliation made very clear, our nation must have the courage to own the truth, to heal the wounds of its past, so that we can move on together at peace with ourselves. Today we see progress towards this aim. Our 2022 Australian Reconciliation Barometer found that 89% of the general community and 93% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people believe it's important to undertake formal truth-telling processes in relation to Australia's shared history. And 86% of the general community and 89% of First Nations people feel it's important for all Australians to learn about past issues of European colonisation and government policies as they affected First Nations Australians. But while these statistics bode well, there are clear differences in truth-telling participation rates. Only 43% of First Nations people have participated in a local truth-telling activity compared with only 6% of the general community. Now, this speaks to the work to be done and the importance of research such as this report, which allows us to envisage what truth-telling can look like, what truths it can uncover, and what good can come thereafter. Because we know, like reconciliation, truth-telling is not just one thing. It spans many different voices, forms, stories, relationships, and methods. This is the power of community truth-telling, which meets people where they live, work, and socialise. And it gives us a fuller, richer understanding of ourselves and our environment. Community truth-telling helps to reclaim First Nations people's rightful place in our national story, shining a light not only on colonisation, but on the profound contributions Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have made to our country. This report shows that, there, that these efforts are well underway in communities right across Australia and provide inspiration and confidence as we look ahead to forging a different shared history with each other. It's only when we all agree what we're moving on from that we can know where to move on to. This is not about division, as some suggest. It is a movement that seeks to bring us closer together. This is what reconciliation is, recognising and healing the past so that we can build a better tomorrow. So thank you all for joining us today for this webinar, and I thank Deacon as well for coming with us on this journey. I implore everyone to read the report, and I cannot wait to hear the insights from our panellists and what they have to share. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Karen Mundine, CEO of Reconciliation Australia. Deakin University and Reconciliation Australia recognise the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to tell their histories in their own voices and to check all content prior to it being shared in a public sphere. 
Transcripts of interviews and a draft of the Recognising Community Truth-Telling Report were shared with interviewees before publication. The project received formal Deakin University Human Research Ethics Approval in May 2021, and an advisory group steered the project. We're now joined by a member of that group to talk us through this research and its importance. Professor Victoria Grieve Williams is a Waramai woman from the mid north coast of New South Wales and an historian with a particular interest in decolonisation. She is actively working to develop approaches to knowledge production that reflect the philosophical basis of Indigenous cultures, namely critical Indigenous theory in a transnational frame. Victoria has published on the history of the Aboriginal family, activism, and more recently on aspects of history and climate change. Victoria has pre-recorded her address to us today. Let me thank Karen Mundine and Andrew Meehan of Reconciliation Australia and your team, specifically Danielle Cooper and Penelope Taylor, for supporting this initiative that led to a groundbreaking project and the report, Recognising Community Truth-Telling, an exploration of local truth-telling in Australia that is being launched today. The Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalisation initiated this project in partnership with Reconciliation Australia and the Centre for Resilient and Inclusive Societies provided funding and support. Dr Vanessa Borowski, who is located at the Deakin Institute, has led the project. Vanessa has proven to be the ideal person for this work. She came to us with a strong background in decolonizing through truth-telling research in South Africa, and she so capably led the research team, Karen Berger and Kirsty Close. I know I speak for the other members of the advisory panel, Yin Paradis and Shona Reed, when I say it has been an absolute delight to work with you all, and we are thrilled with the outcome of your research as showcased in this report. The report includes 10 interview case studies and 15 shorter summary case studies of what has become an increasing phenomenon in Australia. That is, communities taking on the emotional labour of dealing with the very troubling and trauma-ridden aspects of our history. These communities have taught us what truth-telling actually involves and how to go about it. They include an extraordinary array of ongoing activity, including community commemorations, festivals, memorial events, public artwork projects, repatriation of ancestors, return of land, renaming of places, and the creation of healing sites. This report also includes stories of great courage and hope and of people now more relieved of the burden of difficult histories. The reality is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people often live, work and play with non-Indigenous people. We are neighbours and our outmarriage rate is somewhere near 70%. Ordinary people living those ordinary day-to-day -day lives have become aware of the need to reach out and take steps to forge new and enduring relationships. The case studies cover instances in every state and territory except the ACT, whereby people recognise colonial violence, recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty, self-determination and agency, recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, contributions and resilience, and also move toward redress, healing and reconciliation. Importantly, the research has documented these projects to build knowledge about the complexity, strengths and challenges of communities' efforts to tell their truths and the inspiration and methodology that can be drawn from them. They show that there is no need to wait for formal truth-telling processes to come to communities, that often it is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership and support from their allies that bring about substantive changes to attitudes and relationships through repatriation, renaming, reparation, commemoration, public art and education. Our history is rich and diverse and most of us want to engage with it. It is after all a large part of what makes us who we are. If aspects of that history are unacceptable to us, then it is important to deal with it. The reason is that the future remains more important than the past. 
we need to lay down good memories, create good histories for the generations who follow. By doing this, we contribute to a greater well-being for all people and a more united Australia. We become good ancestors. Thank you so much. But Victoria was a member of the advisory committee for this report. We're launching here today, recognising community truth telling. I'm extremely honoured now to be able to bring the voices of the report into this event. We will hear from representatives from community truth telling projects who will share their experiences and insights. This discussion will focus on the important lessons we can draw from grassroots engagement with Australia's colonial history as we grapple with how the vision of truth telling in the Uluru Statement from the Heart could be realised in a way that meaningfully transforms social and political relations in this country. Dr Vanessa Borolsky will guide this discussion. She's a research fellow at Deakin University's Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalisation and was principal researcher on this report, recognising community truth telling. Vanessa has published widely on the challenges of addressing social conflict in South Africa and in Australia. Her work on truth telling is informed by her involvement as a researcher in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission and her subsequent PhD on the Commission's understanding of political violence. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you, Marnie. <clears throat> I too would like to acknowledge country, acknowledge the strength and resilience of traditional owners on Wurundjeri country and recognize that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our wonderful panelists today. Um, first of all, there's Auntie Patsy Cameron, AO, who is a highly regarded elder, author, researcher, and cultural historian from the country of Tebrakuna in Northeast Tasmania, and is one of the founding elders involved in the annual Manalagana Day Festival. Um, Auntie Enid uh, Tom is a Kaurig elder and a director of the Kaurig Native Title Aboriginal Corporation. She's played a pivotal role in numerous community initiatives in the Torres Strait. Thank you to you, Auntie Enid. Um, Uncle Michael James Whitty Welsh is a proud wild one man from the central western plains of New South Wales and is chairperson of the board of the Kintella Boys Home Aboriginal Corporation. Thank you, Uncle Whitty. Dr. Tiffany McComsey is the CEO of Kintella Boys Home Aboriginal Corporation um, and is a passionate community advocate who conducted her PhD on the stolen generations. Uh, thank you to you, to Tiffany. Peter Jones has been a volunteer with the Winga Mai Mali Reconciliation Group, assisting with the coordination of the annual Appen Massacre Memorial for the past 12 years, and has lived on Darawal country for most of his life. So thank you all very much for joining us today, and I know you're all very busy, and I also just want to thank you for your generosity in participating in, in the project as a whole. Um, just to start off, um, we usually understand truth telling in terms of the more formal model of, of truth commissions. But I think what this re research shows um, and the community projects that you've been involved in um, is the many active and creative ways in which we can address the colonial past and more recent experiences of discrimination in ways that recognize um, strength and resilience as well as violation. So in the light of this, um, I'd just like to explore with each of you a bit about the community projects that you've been involved in and how they're related to truth telling. Um, Auntie Patsy, I'll start with you. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the Manalagana Day Festival and why you believe it's important to celebrate the life and legacy of Manalagana and how do you feel that this relates to truth telling? It's an honour to be here today and uh, to discuss uh, with everybody the story of Manalagena. Manalagena's homeland is at Tebrakuna country uh, where Manalagena Day Festival is held on the first Saturday of December each year. He was born in 1775. He's a, he was a formidable warrior, uh, a revered clan bangana or leader 
of the Parabena Chawai clans people, and he was a powerful seer or spirit man. We celebrate the life of Manalagena because he is the ancestral grandfather to many Tasmanian Aboriginal people today. Uh, we are directly related to him through his four daughters who married European mariners in the early 1820s. And it is so important that Manalagena's story is told and remembered by all Australians. Um, Milotina Tiakana Warrena, Heart of Country Aboriginal Corporation, celebrates the life world of Manalagena and commemorates his passing on the 4th of December 1835 while he was in exile at Waibalena on Flinders Island because he is that most important ancestor who nego he negotiated for the survival of our people when the odds of survival were so high. This year will be the eighth Manalagena Day. Um, the cultural activities which are integral to the festival relate directly to community truth telling. They demonstrate that we are still here, that our culture is strong and unique. Our culture is diverse, alive and vibrant. Uh, we celebrate our deep history that is connected to this place, Terrapuna, which is our ancestral homeland. This day is inclusive, safe for all people from all walks of life who are invited to attend each year. Thank you very much, Auntie Patsy. Um, now to, to, to Enid, um, you've worked with the Kara community in the Torres Strait for many years on a number of community projects. Um, one of those projects is working with the descendants of the shipwreck survivor Barbara Thompson, who lived with the Kara community for five years in the 1840s, um, in order to repatriate her remains from Sydney to the Torres Strait. Um, could you tell us why you think this repatriation is important for truth telling? It's very important uh, with the repatriation of Barbara Thompson because when she shipwrecked and lived with our people for five years. She knew everything about our people. Um, she knew how to hunt. She knew the protocols. She knew the burial systems. She knew the kingship systems. She knew the languages. This was prior to our people being massacred. So when Barbara left in 19, 1849, our people were massacred, blamed for a boat attack on a boat called the Spewa, uh, which the captain and the crew were killed. But it wasn't our people who were responsible. However, they found, because of trading in those days, they, between islands, they found some of the things from the ship in the camp of the Kaurigas. So um, the police uh, magistrate, Frank Jardine, along with John Chester, um, gathered troops with guns, came to Prince of Wales Island, Muralag, as, as we know it in our language, and massacred 500 people out of 800. There was only 300 left after the massacre. They were removed from their campsite and they had to live in the front beach of Prince of Wales for over 20 years, while the government was trying to decide what to do with these people. Then they were removed again to another island called Ammon Island, which is in our area in the inner islands of the Torres Strait. And they lived there for another 20 years. Then the, then the um, government soldiers came again with guns pointed at children's head and told them to jump in dinghies, get into a boat called the Swingle. Like cattle, they were loaded onto this boat and taken out to Moa Island in the Torres Strait. Barbara Thompson plays an important part in, a, in, in what she did when she got back on the boat that she was rescued on. She Thank you. wrote, she told the story. Thank you, Auntie Enid. Um, 
now to to go to Uncle Widdy. Um, you're a survivor of the stolen generations yourself, and you've been a key leader in the Kinchella Boys Aboriginal Corporation for a number of years. Um, could you tell us a bit about the truth telling that you've been involved in, and why do you think it's important that there's truth telling about the stolen generations? Thank you. Um, me. <laughs> right. Um, I suppose um, part of the reason why that you'll see you now, um, uh, we're not really um, used to uh, talking about uh, the pain that we went through when we were taken to this place. I, I will speak on behalf of the KBH survivors that went through that place called Kenchula. And uh, some of us never even got the chance to meet or know their mother and fathers again. I was very lucky. I was eight years of age when I was taken away. So I had a bit of time with my family and I was given back to my mother. The truth telling about where we are and what we do and as the survivors of the place is about the bad policies and the evil things that happened to us as children in there, which caused an, a trauma that we now know that it's not just a word that it is a disease of the brain and, and, and a pain. And it's passed upon to our children and our grandchildren, all of our children. So we talk about it in the hope that it'll be better understood. We don't want to blame anybody or hurt anybody. But the thing we want people to do right across this land for all the trauma that's been spread across here from the colonised world that come across here is that there is a reason for our pain. We get rejected from so many things in our lives. Not only just the land that we lived on, the language that we spoke, but our love for our families and all of that was taken away. Never had the family love. I know that my children love me, but it's the love that I built from pain. And to tell the truth about this, so that the younger children of the world and of this land here that we're on knows that there's a lot of healing that needs to happen. I, myself, you'll find it hard because at my age now, I'm only 71. I say only 71, but my child, my child was taken away from me, my eldest child, and my families and children are still being taken away. The policies that they made to do that and allow them to do that, and we talk about reconciliation, they really don't tell the truth about what they're doing. To reconcile something surely means to stop it and don't do it anymore. But there's still 15 to 20,000 children that are in and out of home care. So we need to tell the truth. We need people to understand that we, as a people on this land here, we never had any right. We have ended today with the under 3% or just under 3% of the population. Is we don't make very much difference when it comes to votes. It's the other 97% of the people who vote that makes the decision what's going to happen to us in our lives. We need to stay. We need to stop that. We need to be able to have the power to be able to look after ourselves and our families. Um, I know that Thank there's you. Yeah, the question a little later. That's, that, that's, I'll, I'll pull up there. Thank you, Uncle Woody, for sharing that. What I know is quite a painful story for you. And um, thank you. Um, Peter uh, Jones, you've played a central role in supporting the annual commemoration of the Appen Massacre as part of the Winga Mai Mali Reconciliation Group. Could you tell us a bit about the Appen Massacre and why you think it's important to commemorate it as part of, of truth-telling? 
Sure, and thank you for inviting me to um, sit on this panel and 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 share the time with these other important people and the work that's been done. So, um, the Appen massacre memorial that we commemorate every year uh, happened in um, April of eighteen sixteen. Um, it was significant in that it was an action that was at the direction of the then governor, um, uh, Governor Macquarie. Um, the 46th Regiment, actually, there was a campaign of direct terror uh, to sub subdue resistance on the Cumberland Plain. And uh, the culmination there was that uh, this massacre took place at Appen, which is about 70 um, kilometres southwest of Sydney, uh, as Karen mentioned, very close to ground zero um, and not a, not a lot of years after the original landing. Um, so it's an event that occurs very close to Sydney. Um, you know, it was one of Australia's biggest population centres. It wasn't away. It wasn't, you know, um, out there somewhere. It was very close um, to where many people live. And Cameltown is one of the largest Aboriginal population centres in New South Wales. And we're a place where Aboriginal people come from all over Australia and have many relatives there and many connections to this area. So... Um, the massacre resulted at that time in the deaths of 14 Dural and um, Gunagara people. Um, and that's just the known um, people that, whose lives were lost. Uh, it, it really is significant in that it, it, it was the start of the things that uncle was just talking about this, uh, the, the, it wasn't the start, but it was a significant event in that that not only was there a massacre, but it was at a time when there was deliberate government policy to, to um, affect how Aboriginal people were treated. Um, and I think that's why it's really important. Governor Macquarie was a significant person in Australian history. There's many physical reminders of his presence and the great building that he did for the colony. And I think for us, it's important that part of that truth is told that that came at a cost. Not, not just a cost for then, but an ongoing cost. And I, I think it's really important that we talk about that and carry that forward. Thank you, Peter, that's that's great. Um, I'd now like to talk a bit about the rich diversity of ways in which truth telling or what I, I'd like to call truth doing is occurring at a grassroots level. Um, I think this is very important in order to give the audience some sense of the creative and innovative manner in which co uh, communities have been grappling with Australia's um, colonial history and more recent discrimination. Um, so first to you, Auntie Patsy, I mean, one of the things that really struck me when talking to yourself and other community leaders involved in organizing the Manalagana Day Festival was the significant emphasis on making this an inclusive event. And um, one interview described it as allowing people to wear our ochre so that they understand what having country on you means. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that inclusive approach and what it means to you and why you think that's important for truth telling in particular? Manalagana Day is a unique uh, festival. Uh, by its very nature, it offers truth-telling experiences on country to all people who travel from near and far uh, for the event. Uh, it's really truth-telling in action. It affirms that we are still here and we have much to contribute to the world. Um, we present a range of cultural activities and stories that are tens of thousands of years old. Our ancestral grandfather, Manalagena, was a, a storyteller and he his stories were recorded um, from the early 1800s. And so we treasure those stories. But we bring people together on that day to celebrate, uh, to share our knowledge and our culture. We educate about the significance of culture through ceremony, dance, artistic expression, and tuition by some of our wonderful cultural practitioners uh, on, on country. Um, we promote languages that are spoken by our ancestral grandmothers through storytelling. Um, 
people experience our traditional foods. Uh, we provide crayfish and abalone and all sorts of wonderful foods for people to appreciate just what our um, our resources were in the deep past and, and still are in the present day. Um, they understand the practical and cultural separation of men's and women's business. Uh, they can learn about the local history of Tepequina country uh, from its deep past to the colonial past and the present day. And they can actually be there to look across to Bank, Bank Strait to see where our old people witnessed the arrival of the big ships from Sydney in 1798. And it's, it's not hard for people to imagine what those ships meant to, to Manalagena, uh, who was then 22 years old, and what that meant to people who were isolated from the rest of humanity for 10,000 years. Uh, to be on country means they can actually feel that and see it. They feel safe and welcome to be there because that's how we present our day. Uh, it, it builds our community um, connections for our Aboriginal families who come from all over Australia and as far away uh, as New Zealand for that special day in December. Um, it's a way that we can showcase our precious, precious and unique culture. Thank you, Auntie Patsy. Um, Peter, I think what's unique about the Appen Massacre Memorial is the consistency with which it's taken place um, every year since the early 2000s. Um, could you tell us a bit about the way in which the Reconciliation Commission, our committee has worked together to organize the event, particularly its focus on building relationships and trust between First Nations and non-Indigenous community members? Um, why do you think this focus on trust and relationships is important for the way in which we do truth telling? Well, firstly, I think the importance of trust is you can't work alongside people if you're not going to get along with them. And so the relationship building is absolutely essential. And um, I think, I, I, I guess what's important about our committee and our group is we are gen, genuinely made up of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people from a whole lot of different areas. I'm, I'm a community member. Um, we have Sister Kerry, the leader, who's, you know, a, a, lo a local religious person. We have got local council people. We have many community members. Um, and we have government agencies, uh, such as the police, um, Water New South Wales, and, and a whole lot of um, NGOs who provide a whole lot of different types of services in the community. Um, to get a big uh, sausage sizzle together, which, you know, at the core is partly what we do is we bring to people together for a feed. It's a lot of, it's a lot of little tasks and it's all those little tasks, each individual little task is really important to the whole. Um, so it takes a lot of conversations and a lot of those conversations are not just about where will the onions get cut, but it's about why we're cutting the onions and why we're bringing people together. And, you know, I've, I'm a newbie. I've only been there for 12 years of the 25 years. So I'm in, in kindergarten still with regards to learning about the people and the event, but um, it, it it's a, the constant participation. Wingamai only means uh, let's sit down and talk in Wiradjuri language, one of the many languages that is in Campbelltown as a result of where people come from. So that the way that we come together and organize that, I, I don't I was trying to think just then there's probably 15 to 20 different organizations, but it might be just one person. But at the end of the day, they bring their families, they bring their friends, they bring their colleagues to the to our event. Um, and and I think that's that process of just having all of those conversations is what the fabric is of reconciliation. It's not seeing difference. It's seeing purpose and seeing a message and a common message for us all. And we've become friends and that's that's what's important. Thank you, Peter. Um, Enid, uh, Auntie Enid, the current community um, in the Torres Strait have had a unique history and identity with links both to the Aboriginal communities of Cape York 
and also with the people of the Torres Strait. And I think as you were talking about earlier, they've suffered significant colonial violence and displacement from traditional homelands. So in the light of that um, winning native title on some of the Torres Strait Islands, I think has been very important for the Karug community. So could you tell us a bit about how the Karug Aboriginal Corporation recently won an injunction um, stopping development on a sacred story site at Murrow Lake or Prince of Wales Island? And why do you think it's important to protect sacred sites like the one at, at Marilak and why is that important for, for truth telling as far as uh, you're concerned? The case um, that we won against the local Shire Council was um, because of um, no consultation was um, held with the Kaurig Native Title Aboriginal Corporation for the traditional elders. So at the last day of the week, I had to put an injunction in. So I called the lawyers and they put an injunction in on that Friday. And so we won the injunction. So they had to remove all the um, equipment from Prince of Wales, Omuralag. Um, and then they decided we all we wanted was for them to sit at the table, consult with us about what service is better for people that are living in our community, you know, on our island. And, um, all we asked was that they consult with us and they didn't do it. So they said, now we've got money to take you to court. So it was the only way that we could say, listen, you need to recognize there are traditional owners and show respect for our country and our stories and our sacred areas. You know, um, you can't just go and do what you want before pre Mabo days, you can. This is after Mabo. And so there is native title in place on Prince of Wales. And so I had to, um, yeah, so we won the case and we were happy um, because nothing was done there. But we still have facility that the residents on Prince of Wales want. They still want to come to the party to do a little pontoon because the tide is only low twice a year on Prince of Wales on that beach. And the, the, the School kids, when they go home from school, they have to walk on corals twice a year. And these guys wanted to build a big marina. All the people on the beach. Thank you, Auntie Enid. Um, uh, Uncle Whitney and, and Tiffany, the, um, the Kinchilla Boys Home Aboriginal Corporation has done incredible work supporting survivors and descendants of the stolen generations. Um, recently, the corporation created a mobile education center in a re refurbished bus that has been touring New South Wales to educate people about the stolen generations. Um, and one thing that's really interested me about the corporation and other stolen gen survivors is the desire to return to and reclaim the site where you were taken. Um, in this instance, the Conchella Boys Home, as a site of healing and truth telling. So could you tell us a bit about that and why you feel that that is important for truth telling? The one thing that I realized in my life and our journey of being lost, I wasn't too sure where my pain was coming from and what it was. I didn't know that uh, my silence was allowing for me and not only me, your family, the brother, but the brothers were us. We wanted to blow that place up or burn it down. We didn't want to ever know that ever again. But the fact is, is that that would not have served the purpose of being able to take away this pain that we carry. And we know about our pain. We know what we need to do for it. And the one thing about that site is so if we have the site and we're able to tell the stories about what happened in there and be in a, see it, to look, look at it is to understand it and when we understand it, we know how to put things into place to be able to fix it, to heal it. Because the policies were that when they took us in there, we went through that gate, that little child never existed anymore. We were put into the position that we were slaves for those to do what they wanted us to do and to create us into slaves to work for the white policy of this country to be a white Australia. So now we tell the truth about it 
and the proof of it being there to look at it is a very strong thing. And we know our spiritual world is there from our people that have passed on and gone. But that's a different spirit. That's an evil spirit, that one. So we need to look at it. We need to see it. We need to be able to walk around it, through it, everything that's possible. And that in itself is just something that I was number 36 when I went through that gate, no longer to use my name. My brother was number 17, no longer to use his name. If we got caught speaking our names, we got punished or flogged or starved, it didn't matter, They're just whatever they wanted to do. So that now, in these days, we as brothers, we call each other by our names and we, numbers that we know each other for because it's our power. We have survived it. And the thing is, that our descendants are the ones that we want to understand that they carry this pain too. In their bloodline, we pass everything down. The same as my family has passed the beautiful things upon to me, that I can play a ukulele and a guitar, and nobody's ever taught me that, but my grandfather playing the violin around the campfire the night before they took me. My mother playing the piano around the campfire the night before they took me. All of that stuff as I got older, and I realised that there was something that was there. They brought that out of me. Now, by the developing this homes down there, we don't like that word homes. It was never a home. It was a evil place. But when that is done, that is the beginning of the true healing, not only just for us, but for other people of that land, that land that was what it was before they did this to us. That's what we want, that homes. The bus, I'm going to just ask Tiffany to have a little bit of a word and explain about the bus. That is such a powerful journey of truth telling too. Um, the Mobile Education Centre um, has been incredible because it's really allowing survivors um, of Kinchla Boys Home to go back to communities across the state where they were actually taken from originally. And it's that deep process of community truth telling um, to reconnect those legacies back to those places and to connect people to the actual site itself. The incredible way the bus allows for people to hear from the uncles in a safe way to really understand what the impact has been, but also why during certain decades during those removals did they happen in a certain community. So it's allowing elders to be part of that conversation who acknowledge seeing boys and girls taken, losing their friends, their brothers and sisters, and not knowing why or what happened to them. And elders being able to heal in this process is just part of this journey and incredible for young people who say this can never happen again. And that's what the uncles and aunties say. Our pain needs to stop with us. We need our children to be free of this pain. And that's what this work is trying to do. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, to, to wrap up, um, I just wanted to ask each of the panelists to give us a few final thoughts about how we can strengthen truth telling going forward based on your experience of truth telling at a community level. Um, Auntie Patsy, can we start with you? So, from the very beginning, uh, eight years ago, Manalagena Day started with about 60 family members coming and celebrating and commemorating uh, Manalagena and celebrating our survival on country. Um, today it, it's grown uh, and last year we had over 800 family members and friends who came from all over the state from uh, across the mainland and as I said earlier as far away as New Zealand. Um, Tasmanian Aboriginal people came from these places as well as uh, our extended family. So it's become an important day on the events calendar in Tasmania. Um, and I think that means it'll grow and continue to grow. And therefore, community truth-telling experiences will, will, will strengthen as a result. I think one of the additions to that will increase that and strengthen that experience will be having our young people who are now training as rangers on Tebukuna country, that they will be there to talk about and showcase 
they're caring for country. So that's a whole new area that we'll be incorporating into Mantle again today to, to allow people to see that we they have a role in reviving and restoring our cultural land and seascape um, as part of Mantle again today. I think that's going to be very important and we'll, we'll strengthen the, the truth-telling process. Um, the truth-telling importance of Mantle again today is experienced through a prism that cannot be found in libraries uh, or taught in schools. And I think that's our strength. People coming and being on country, listening to our stories, learning our history, seeing our culture being practiced on our homeland that we're all very proud of. Uh, I think that that is our truth. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Patsy. Um, Peter, would you like to give us some final thoughts about strengthening truth telling going forward? Sure. And, and I think I'd, the first thing I'd say to my non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters is that remember that wherever you're living, working or playing in this country, you're on stolen land. Um, and your job is to find out about as much as you can about living, working and playing on this land and find it out from the people who own its stories and its culture um, and listen. And if there's things on, go, go and attend and be patient and be present and take part when you can. Um, and, you know, let that guide you. What If you've got some skills, you maybe can offer them. Um, if, you, if you're in Appen, if you, you know, if you're somewhere around Sydney in April or somewhere, come, come to Appen, come and stand in the circle with the whole of a community and experience what it's like to hear those words, to listen to that story and, and to be present and, you know, walk away. And when you walk away, carry that story with you and come back next year and bring some family and friends. And hopefully that, all those little, you know, little sliced onions and little conversations will continue, you know, continue on. And just don't be afraid, find out, get involved. So you might get told to go away, and that is also okay. Then think about how you might have approached trying to be involved, and then try again. That's a, what I can say, I'd say. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Auntie Enid, um, any last thoughts from you about strengthening truth-telling um, based on your experience around Barbara Thompson and your um, interaction with her descendants? Yeah, um, with truth telling, I believe that uh, with Barbara Thompson, why she played an important part in our role where we are today um, is because she had, uh, she had um, a story. She told a story. And so there was books written about it. There was three books, but the book that I believe is the true book is this actually book, this book here, which is Aborigines and Islanders of the Cape. This was written by an anthropologist called David Armour. Now in this book, he only took the notes of uh, Os Oswald Briley. So in this book, there's people's names being recorded when Barbara was there in Prince of Wales, which is very important to us. Our languages are being recorded because we lost our language after the removal. We now speak Western Torres Strait. We have Aboriginal language. So all these things came into play. And that's why I feel I talk to everybody that I meet around Australia when I'm traveling around doing meetings. I talk to everybody about Barbara Thompson because she actually saved us, the future generation, by recording these things. And that's why I'm very grateful for her. And that's why if you talk about reconciliation, Barbara has to be repatriated back because she was traditionally adopted by the chief while she was with us. She belongs Thank to Kauri. Thank you, Enid. Um, Tiffany and Uncle Woody, um, some last thoughts from, from you about strengthening truth-telling going forward. Uh, first, we heard the word language uh, used a couple of times there that I was down at the guest at the government house down here in 2017 on 11th of October that they gave me a piece of paper 
that I laminated it. And the truth of the fact is that piece of paper told me that I was now allowed to own and speak my own language. This is the thing that people don't really understand. But that's how fresh and new this truth telling is about the lies that have been told about us. And 2017, and I don't know too many words of my people's language. I, I, I broke down and cried when my grandchild walked up to me and spoke a little bit of Nimpa language, which is the, our Wawan people's dialogue. And the, the family structure to me and my family is the most important thing I think that could ever possibly happen to us, the children of just about anybody of this land where they broke down our cultures, our language, and when they took us away from our families. We ask for the right for them to redo their policies and give us the resources to be able to rebuild our family structure that was broken under their policies and take us back and identify us for the lands where we were taken away from, which they did under their policies. They make their policies, give us the resources, let us have the right to have that and have a go at that so that it can, families can share and be more sociable in communities. Communities is important to point that out too because communities are so then diverse. Now, when they put us on those missions, those missions were concentration camps. Now, I remember Pop and then talking about the early days of those there, but they were no longer to speak their language when they were put on there. They were long, no longer to hunt the foods and uh, that they were allowed to hunt when they were put on there. So they were given the order that they would be fed by them. And I know that I've got it written in some of the books that are written to me in that the flour that they used to give our people, they used to put strychnine, cyanide, arsenic in it or whatever it is to kill our people when they made the, the Johnny cakes or the dampers. Yeah. And this, this is the truth. We need to tell the truth. There's no need. We can't go anywhere at all until the truth is told. And again, we don't want anybody to be punished. We don't want anybody to be hurt. We just want to have the right to be treated equal. Thank you, Uncle Weddy. That Those are very wise words. Um, I'd like to wrap, wrap up the panel now and thank all of you so much for your contributions um, to the panel and to the report. And I'll hand back to, to Marnie to, to wrap up. Thank you, Dr. Vanessa Borowski. And enormous thanks to Auntie Patsy Cameron, Auntie Enid Tom, Uncle Witty Welsh, Peter Jones and Tiffany McComsey for sharing your stories, your perseverance, your pride and indeed your pain. Thank you to Karen Mundine, CEO of Reconciliation Australia for guiding us at the beginning of this event. And thanks to Deakin University for organising and running this webinar today. Of the many things discussed today, we heard of the absolute importance of relationships, of trust, voice, of listening, and of bravery when we're all working together for a better understanding of the past in order to build a better future. It's clear that we as a nation are still reckoning with the way this country's history has been told through representations of our collective identity and national story. And until we share and accept Australia's true histories from before and after colonisation and our very recent history too, we cannot be reconciled. As the 2000 Australian Declaration Towards Reconciliation made clear, our nation must have the courage to own the truth to heal the wounds of its past so that we can move on together at peace with ourselves. This brings our launch to an end, but the work of truth telling continues. I urge you to read this report and learn from it. Thank you for joining us and good afternoon.